Hello and welcome to my storybook cottage and thank you so much for joining me. Today I'm going to talk about my favourite book, New Grub Street by George Gissing. Now it was published in 1896 so it's a Victorian classic but it isn't a very well-known Victorian classic and you could argue that Jane Austen, well who wasn't Victorian, or, or Tolstoy or Trollope, they were better. But this is the book that really strikes me in the heart because this is a book about writers, different kind of writers in the 1890s. So the characters in it are like Edward Reardon, who's a middle brown novelist, and Jasper Milvane, who's a popular journalist, and Harold Biffin, who's a sort of cutting edge, marginal literary novelist, and then Marion and Alfred Yule produce sort of worthy, heavy essays for quarterly magazines and essay collections. And it looks at both the art and business of writing in a way that it just nails it. it. It takes it apart. I've never seen it bettered anywhere. And there are so many things about this that, has, that so resonate with me. Like, for example, this line, or this paragraph, I should say. Sometimes the three hours labour of a morning resulted in half a dozen lines corrected into illegibility. His brain would not work. He could not recall the simplest synonyms. Intolerable faults of composition drove him mad. He would write a sentence beginning thus, she took a book with a look of, or thus, a revision of this decision would have made him an object of derision or if the period were other, otherwise inoffensive, it ran in a rhythmic gallop, which was a torment to the ear. I can so relate to that. And I love being reminded of this book and I love going places that remind me of this book. And that's why I thought I'd look at a few places in the mountains that do remind me of this book. One thing we have a lot of in the Blue Mountains is mist or fog, though I think fog has more pollution in it. Fog also features prominently in New Grub Street. I'll just read you an extract. But the fog was making their eyes water and getting into their throats. By when they reached Tottenham Court Road, they were both thoroughly uncomfortable. The bus had to be waited for, and in the meantime they talked scrappily, coughily. In the vehicle things were a little better, but here one could not converse with freedom. What pestilent conditions of life, exclaimed Jasper, putting his face rather near Marion's. I wish to goodness we were back in those quiet fields, you remember, with the September sun warm about us. Shall you go to Finden again before long? I really don't know. I'm sorry to say my mother is far from well. In any case, I must go at Christmas, but I'm afraid it won't be a cheerful visit. Arrived at Hampstead Road, he offered his hand for goodbye. I wanted to talk about all sorts of things, but perhaps I shall find you again some day. He jumped out and waved his hat in the lurid fog. Some of the back alleys of Katoomba have a vaguely Victorian Londonish look about them, with or without fog. Another thing that features a lot in New Grub Street is magazines and journals, old fashioned ones, which are very different from today's magazines and journals. Let me read you a few extracts about the London Press in 1896. He turned and saw Welpdale. What brings you on these premises, he asked as they shook hands. A man I know has just been made sub-editor of chat upstairs. He has half promised to let me do a column of answers to correspondence. Cosmetics? Fashions? Cookery? Oh, I'm not so versatile as all that, unfortunately. No, the general information column. Will you be so good as to inform me, through the medium of your invaluable paper, what was the exact area devastated by the Great Fire of London? That kind of thing. You know... Hotburn, that's the fellow's name, tells me that his predecessor always called the paper Chatmos 
because of the frightful difficulty he had in filling it up each week. By the by, what a capital column that is of yours in the Will o' the Wisp. I know nothing like it in English journalism. Upon my word, I don't. We want, remarked Mr Quarmby, we want a monthly review which will deal exclusively with literature. The fortnightly, the contemporary, they are very well in their way, but then they are mere miscellanies. You will find one solid literary article amid a confused mass of politics and economics and general claptrap. Articles on the currency and railway statistics and views of evolution, said Mr Hinks, with a look as if something were grating between his teeth. The quarterlies, put in Yule. Well, the original idea of the quarterlies was that there are not enough important books published to occupy solid reviewers more than four times a year. That may be true, but then a literary monthly would include much more than professed reviews. Hinks's essays on the historical drama would have come out in it very well. Or your Spanish poets, Quarmby. I want to find a capitalist, he said, who will get possession of that paper chat and transform it according to an idea I have in my head. The thing is doing very indifferently, but I'm convinced it might be made a splendid property with a few changes in the way of conducting it. The paper is rubbish, remarked Jasper, and the kind of rubbish, oddly enough, which doesn't attract people. Precisely, but the rubbish is capable of being made a very valuable article if it were only handled properly. I have talked to the people about it again and again, but I can't get them to believe what I say. Now, just listen to my notion. In the first place, I should slightly alter the name, only slightly, but that little alteration would in itself have an enormous effect. Instead of chat, I should call it chit-chat. Jasper exploded with mirth. That's brilliant, he cried. A stroke of genius. Are you serious? Or are you making fun of me? I believe it is a stroke of genius. Chat doesn't attract anyone, but chit-chat would sell like hotcakes, as they say in America. I know I am right. Laugh as you will. The study was a weekly paper of fair repute. Fadge had harmed it, no doubt of that, by giving it a tone which did not suit the majority of its readers, serious people who thought that the criticism of contemporary writing offered an opportunity for something better than a display of malevolent wit. But a return to the old earnestness would doubtless set all right again, and the joy of sitting in that dictatorial chair, the delight of having his own organ once more, of making himself a power in the world of letters, of emphasising to a large audience his developed methods of criticism. An embittered man is a man beset by evil temptations. The study contained each week certain columns of flying gossip. And when he thought of this, Yule also thought of Clement Fadge and sundry other of his worst enemies. How the gossip column can be used for hostile purposes, yet without the least overt offence, he had learned only too well. Sometimes the mere omission of a man's name from a list of authors can mortify and injure. Last but not least, there's a lot of steam train action in the Blue Mountains. And that's nice for me because steam trains feature prominently in New Grub Street. They usually represent really powerful emotions like hope and despair. For instance, shortly after this, they came to the bridge over the railway line. Jasper looked at his watch. Will you indulge me in a piece of childishness, he said. In less than five minutes, a London Express goes by. I have often watched it here and it amuses me. Would it weary you to wait? I should like to, she replied with a laugh. The line ran along a deep cutting from either side of which grew hazel bushes and a few larger trees. Leaning upon the parapet of the bridge, Jasper kept his eye in the westward direction where the gleaming rails were visible for more than a mile. Suddenly he raised his finger. You hear? Marion had just caught the far off sound of the train. She looked eagerly and in a few minutes saw it approaching. The front of the engine blackened nearer and nearer, coming on with dread force and speed. A blinding rush and there burst against the bridge a great volley of sunlit steam. Milvane and his companion ran to the opposite parapet, but already the whole train had emerged and in a few seconds it had disappeared around a sharp curve. The leafy branches that grew out over the line swayed violently backwards and forwards in the perturbed air. If I were 10 years younger, said Jasper, laughing, I should say that was jolly. It inspires me. It makes me feel eager to go back and plunge into the fight again. A 
the railway station they ate and drank together, but with poor pretense of appetite. As long as possible they kept within the warmed rooms. Reardon was pale and had anxious, restless eyes. He could not remain seated, though when he had walked about for a few minutes, the trembling of his limbs obliged him to sit down. It was an unutterable relief to both when the moment of the train starting approached. They clasped hands warmly and exchanged a few last requests and promises. Forgive my plain speech, old fellow, said Biffin. Go and be happy. Then he stood alone on the platform, watching the red light on the last carriage as the train whirled away into darkness and storm. That train you just saw was built in 1899 and the carriage in 1891, and they live at the Valley Heights Rail Museum in the Blue Mountains, which houses a lot of other trains besides that one. Like this passenger express train, and this heavy goods train and this steam tram which is the kind of thing my great grandfather might have worked on in Manly. This one is the last operating steam tram in Australia. There are also lovely carriages of all kinds, passenger and freight, and some early diesel and electric engines. And because the museum sits on an old railway siding, it has a lot of incredible rail infrastructure, including this turntable, which allows one person to turn an entire engine. Even though it's a very, very old piece of infrastructure, it still works. And you can see where it used to feed the trains into the roundhouse. Inside one of the museum rooms, there's a model of this elaborate siding, the way it used to be. And there's a model of Valley Heights Station as it is now. And there are other models because you can't have too many. This is the original Valley Heights station from when it was just called the Valley and had one of those stone crossing guards cottages that I mentioned in another episode. There's a lot of train memorabilia in the museum, including a history of the beloved Blue Mountains commuter train called the Fish, which has been running for about 150 years, the oldest named passenger service in Australia. There's such a sense of history in this museum and it really helps me to connect with my favourite book, especially because I've read that book so many times that a fresh injection of atmosphere can get me excited about New Grub Street all over again. Yeah.